the red flag flying here. Hello, welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today we are here with Peter Doyle. Hi, Peter. Hi, how do you do? Uh, I'm absolutely fine. How are you? Good, good. Excellent. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, born and bred in Gateshead. Joined the Labour Party in 1962. Um, been around a lot of years. Um, been in some political organisations, founding member and militant in Tyneside, um, union organiser, union activist, poor, um, um, been there, seen it, got the t-shirt, um, used to the bureaucracy inside the Labour Party, still disgusted with them, of course, um, um, uh, and even more disgusted with the bureaucracy inside the trade union movement. So I'm looking forward to giving some background on on all of that. Sounds really interesting, um, and I'm surprised with that background. They let you in the Labour Party at the moment, the way things are. But you know, um, <laughs> so uh, let's get into the let's get into the main thing. The main well, just on discussion. that. Yeah. Sorry, just on that. Um, I wake up every morning and go down and get the post. Uh, and I'm really disappointed that I haven't got my auto exclusion uh, notice. It's, it's, uh, it's very difficult if you're claiming to be on the left, not to be able to brandish one of those things and say, look, that proves it. I'm really on the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that couldn't... Uh... Couldn't agree with that more at the moment. It appears that uh, it does seem to be something that they're going after people on the left for. Yeah. So, um, and I guess those people are socialists. So that leads us into the question, what is socialism to you? It's everything. It's absolutely everything. I was born in Gated in the avenues, uh, a poor part of Gated. And Gateshead was just poor um, in the 40s. Um, my mum was a milkman, milkwoman, milk person for the co-op. Used to deliver milk on a ho with a horse and cart. My dad was a bus driver. We didn't have two pennies to rub together. My mum was in the Communist Party until 1956. My dad was a Labour Party member, but primarily an activist in the union, the Transport and General Workers Union. Um, so I knew from a very early time in my life that there was the potential for a better world. There was a potential for something better than we had. And what we had was a Tyneside flat without hot water, without an inside toilet, without a bathroom, um, and everybody where I lived, everybody was in the same situation, thousands of us, um, without uh, central heating, without the ability to have a bath. I used to have to go to the Mulgrave baths um, in Gateshead, uh, and that was a swimming bath, but they had slipper baths up a height. And I had to get a bath once a week, whether I needed it or not. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I knew from a very, very early um, stage in my life that there was something better. There was, there was a potential for ordinary people to live a better life. Now, I wasn't very sure what that was when I was a kid, um, but, but you can't avoid picking up on stuff that your mom and dad say. Um, and boy, did they say it an awful lot. Um, uh, I, I think I'm the only one that you'll get on 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 this um, video chat or any of your video chats. I think I'll be the only one that, at the age of nine, I I, I was listening to a debate or an argument between me mom and me dad over the Sino um, Sino Russian um, um, conflict, um, the split between Mao. And Stalin, and uh, 
I, again, I didn't follow a word of it actually, um, but uh, but uh, but it sticks with you. It stays with you. It lodges into your head. Um, so yeah, I, I knew for from a long time that there was something potentially better than we had. So that's really interesting. So you're one of those people who were kind of almost born into it in a way because we get like different people coming to, coming into socialism from different places, but it's sort of like in your blood, in your family, round the round the dinner table kind of socialism for you. Well, you, you, you I mean, everybody comes into it in a, a you know in a different way. I mean, I, I, I became involved when I was 15 and a half, 16 with Militant and I was given the manifesto of the Communist Party to read. And I remember sitting in the front room with me man and I'm reading this or I'm trying to read it. And I remember saying to her, what does Burgoyse mean? And she said, what? what what's Burgoyse mean? And she said, give us a look at that and I'll, Oh, that means bourgeois son. So I read it because it said proletariat and burgoisy or bourgeois. Um, and it gave an explanation of what they were. And, you know, the only thing that struck me, not, not anything to do with Marxism, but why did he use a French word? I'm from Gated, for fuck's sake. Um, I, I never did a French lesson in my life. Why is he writing in French? Um, and, and I struggled with the academic side of Marxism, capital, and, and all the rest of it. Um, although I did agree with the, the, the general um, position that Militant, for example, put forward at that time. But I joined the Young Socialists when I was 15. Um, that was a, a really, really, really good um, um, school for me. Um, um, all those young comrades, all of were earnestly trying to understand what politics was about. Um, um, so, so yeah, that was a, that was a very good school for me. But I still wasn't finished my journey. Um, um, coming to Marxism was a struggle for me. I didn't. I mean, have you ever read Capital? Yeah, yeah, it's hard, hard work, especially when oh, you're going hard, on for about, work. Um, <laughs> about uh, an hour about like um about um shield yarn when you're on about like yarn and you're like, okay, right, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, and I fell at the first hurdle. So my my introduction to politics and my journey into politics. Was, was was a hard one to a large extent. Uh, I, I, I got a job and my dad worked for the Northern General Transport. He got us a job there um, and he thought I'd landed on my feet. Um, I got a job in the office and I was a trainee schedules clerk. And, and in 1966, there was a by-election for, um, uh, for the Wilson was in power, there was a by-election in Hull. So me and a mate hitchhiked down to Hull Friday, Friday, Friday night. Um, and we worked Saturday and Sunday and set back on Sunday. And it took with three days to get back. No fucker would stop for it um, on, the, on the roads. And it took with three days to get back. And, uh, and I, I went into work and the boss said to us, you're more interested in politics than you are in your job, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah, I am actually. And I got the sack. Um, so the very first job I had, I got the sack because I'd been away canvassing. Um, but it, it was different times then. I picked a job up straight away. Um, and there was no problem in finding um, jobs in those days. Uh, so, so one of my journeys uh, into socialism and trying to understand it was was getting the sack. Um, I got the sack because I'd been active in politics and also I'd been active in trying to get blokes I worked with into the union 
and I'd been quite successful. And I think that was the real reason I got the sack. Not that I'd been away canvassing and it took us a long time to get back. I think the sack is because I was a union activist at the very young age of 16 and 17. Um, so that was one, one thing. I, I worked in the shipyards for a good number of years. Um, that's when the penny started to drop with me um, about socialism and the meaning of socialism and the meaning of Marxism. It wasn't anything that I was picking up in the books. Um, uh, it was about wealth and the creation of wealth. And there was all these blokes, primarily one or two women, but all of these workers working very, very hard out in the open, um, in all weathers, building ships for John Hunter. And that fucker just took the, took the profits and we got poor wages. Um, I, I, I've worked in, uh, I worked in Clark Chapman's in marine engineering. I worked in Wright and Anderson's. Um, my first clash with people over racism was in Wright and Anderson's. Uh, two Indian lads started work and, and there was fucking murders on. This was in 19, 1967. And there was murders on. And I deliberately went out of my way and sat with them um, while they were having the, the bait, because there wasn't a canteen. You just sat in all your dirt um, and ate your sandwiches. Um, and, and, and there the, the blokes I was working with were complaining about these Indian uh, lads that, that had started work and, and the, they were prepared to put up with sitting in their own muck while they ate uh, while they ate the sandwiches and uh, and and I, I, that was the first time I realized the power of racism and the way that it can take people's minds off the real issues and the real problems At any rate I got them into the union these two lads um, the, uh, I, I, uh, I went to branch meetings with them to get them used to going to branch meetings um, and then people started talking to them one or two, um, who were the union people, um, because they were pleased to see them at, at, at a union branch, them out of strike. And, and I was a shop steward at the time, and I issued sort of directions to the, to the pickets, not to, no violence, no, no, no uh, uh, absolutely don't give them an opportunity to send the police in, uh, no violence. And we were on the picket line and these, uh, the management had offered triple time for working weekends and, and bank holidays. So there was some people broke the strike and they were coming in and the pickets were arguing with them and talking to them. And these two blokes started coming out with absolute filthy racist abuse against these two Indian lads who were on the picket line with her. And uh, and there was me telling everybody not to not, not not to have any violence, not to start any fights. And I rushed at one of the blokes and nutted him, and uh, and 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 knocked him flying. And the other one ran for it, and I ran after him, and I started beating him up. Um, and the police were called, and I was picked up and uh, taken to Swinburne Street and gated. And uh, my dad came to get us out bail is out um, pending a court case and and, uh, and as the as the police were letting us out I started bad mouthing the police um, as you do when you're young and daft um, and started saying to them that they were the armed uh, force of the state they didn't know what I was talking about these coppers in Gated um, at any rate, my dad overheard all of this and he said, I'm not bailing you, get yourself back into the into the cell. You're a silly fucker. Um, you want one, you want to keep your mouth shut, and two, these lads are just workers in uniform. Get yourself back into and he walked out and he wouldn't bail us out. And uh at any rate, the coppers dealt with us when I got back to the cell. Um, they gave us a good hiding. Um and then Three, four days later, I was done for grievous bodily harm. And uh, 
Went back to work, the management wouldn't let us in, everybody walked out, everybody walked out. Um, I was I was fined, uh, I think I was fined 50 quid, I can't remember now what it was, but there was a collection in, in, the, in the workplace and they paid me fine as well. Um, so, so their lessons, <laughs> that was better than reading a book. Uh, it really was. But then the book started making sense. And then the bits of the book, you know, the capitals broken down into small pamphlets. And, uh, and then the pamphlet started making sense. And then I got it. And then I could read books. But, but somebody gave us a very good tip. Uh, when I when I was saying to them that I didn't understand a word of the manifesto of the Communist Party when I when I when I first started reading Marxism and he uh, advised us and he gave us two books that was very kind of him he gave us uh, Howard Fast's Spartacus and Upton Sinclair's The Jungle um, and, and 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 if anybody's watching this. Um, I advise you to, if you haven't ever read those two books, please get them. Howard Fast, Spartacus, Upton Sinclair, The Jungle, two of the best socialist books I've ever read in my life. And uh, the impact Howard Fast's book had on us was I wanted to be um, a gladiator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but it also, the message he was getting across came across loud and clear it was very very good so yeah my journey into politics because this is what i think i'm talking about now um my journey into politics was was varied i uh final point on on this journey when i was 12 oh my mom's a communist my dad's an activist in the in his union but he's a lapsed catholic I mean, really lapsed, 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 lapsed Catholic. Um, but he was very unsure about whether there was a God or there wasn't, and whether that God was a Catholic God or some other sort of fucking God. So, so he sent us to a Catholic school. And uh, at the age of 12, I decided I wanted to be a missionary priest. I wanted to go to Africa and I wanted to help those poor black people who couldn't uh, feed themselves because there was constant famines mentioned on the radio. This is before television, by the way, uh, or before we got a television. So I wanted to be a, uh, um, um, a missionary priest. So I went away to uh, a seminary in Liverpool, uh, Mill Hill Fathers in Formby Point, Liverpool. What a disaster that was. What an absolute disaster. Um, oh, I, re I asked one of the priests a question. This was near the end when I was up to there with it, um, starting to doubt everything I was told. Uh, and I said, look, there's three persons in one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. What's the Holy Ghost do? Who is the Holy Ghost? And he said, well, the Holy Ghost is a mystery which will be revealed upon your death. And at the, now I'm now 14. And at the age of 14, I twigged it. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you haven't got a clue and you've been shoving this down my bloody throat for the last two years. And you haven't got a clue. Um, and I ran away. And uh, that was the first time I ever appeared in, um, on a headline in a newspaper. It was, have you seen this boy? Because I did a runner. And it took us a day and a half to get back. I'm really bad at travelling back home. It took us a day and a half to get back. Um, um, but I, I told lies and got on the trains. And I uh, was picked up by a guard, thank goodness, um, who reported it, the police. And the police were waiting for us in Newcastle. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. They got us back to me, mom. But uh, so, so some advice. Fight like hell. Always fight. 
try and understand Marxism as best you can and don't go to a seminary. Uh, oh, terrible. Cruelty. The cruelty. Never mind. That's another story for some other time. Uh, uh, so that's a, part of my journey. A, what a great story and what a great set of stories they've been. Um, I, like people at home won't know, but I've been laughing along with those stories and like you know that and uh, going oh at the at the difficult bits there. Um, and I really like I could go in so many different directions. I could go, but one of the things I was thinking about is you're talking about working in the shipyards and and stuff and a bit of a double barreled question here one is like do you think it was better then because i think a lot of people look back with rose tinted glasses was it better then as a worker and also have we lost the meaning of solidarity over the years because you there were, in that story there was a lot of solidarity shown to you when you um, you showed solidarity with those uh, with those indian workers and then the workers showed solidarity to you when you came back. Is that something that we don't see enough of in workplaces now, do you think? Well, well, look, uh, first of all, the shipyards aren't there. The pits aren't there. The marine engineering isn't there. Wright and Andersons isn't there. Rare rolls isn't there. There were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of workers in those factories, and they're not there any longer. Now, I'll give you a story about solidarity. I'm a full-time trade union official by this stage, um, um, and I've got a strike in, in Gateshead, in, in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. But I'm not the only one that's got a strike on, because it's a national strike. But Thatcher has just invaded the Falklands, so we're off the front page. No publicity at all. It was always, it was all about the glorious fleet um, and how we were going to teach those orgies a good lesson, etc., 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 etc. And 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 I I I phoned up a bloke called Jimmy Murray, who you might have heard of, um, but Jimmy was the convener for Vickers on the Tyne, and he was a great lad, an absolutely great lad. And I explained to him what the difficulty was, that it could be that we might lose the strike. We might, we're losing the momentum. We're losing, um, um, you know, because of a lack of publicity and all sorts of things. And Jimmy said, well, give us, give us a few days. And he phoned up the shipyards that were still there. He phoned up the pits that were still there. He, fa he phoned up railroads that was still there. Parsons on, on, on Shields Road in Newcastle, which was still there. Some 3,000 people worked at, at Parsons alone. Um, and uh, uh, the convened uh, a convener's meeting. And I wasn't at it, but I was told about it afterwards. And there was 25, 30 conveners from the whole of Tyneside turned up and they called a one-day strike. And we had a general strike in Tyneside, in, in engineering. Now, not all of those workers came onto the picket lines, but an awful lot of them did. And what a boost that gave to the, to the dispute and the strike. You only have solidarity where it's possible to have solidarity. And if it, what we've lost, what we've lost, is that core of industrial unionism. We've lost it, it's gone. Um, and that was one of our strengths, it was also one of our weaknesses as well, but it was, it certainly was one of our strengths and, and we've lost that. Um, is there solidarity now? Well, yes, of course there is. Of course there is. And, and, and they're too numerous to mention, but um, Black Lives Matter, what a what a what a what a sign of of solidarity that that is with all of the uh, non-black non-brown people all the white people that are on those demonstrations demanding equal rights e demanding equality um, so yeah I can I can give 
101 examples of that solidarity, but it's not industrial solidarity. Now it could be again, it could be again, but, but at this moment in time, that's, that's something that we've lost. We had unions affiliated to the TUC, we had 15 million. It's now just over six, maybe it's approaching seven million. That's not because people have given up in despair at the trade unions, that's the way that industry and, and the British economy has been savaged year after year after year by successive Tory governments and new Labour governments. We lost two million manual workers when Blair was the Prime Minister. So he did us no favours either. Um, and Gordon Brown and his discussion about uh, um, uh, about um, how he's stopped boom and bust. What a lot of bloody nonsense. And in 2008, the biggest bloody crash since 1929 happens and, and, uh, and then he goes out and he saves the world by buying off the bankers. I've got a story about the bankers, which I'll come on to in a minute. Very, very, very interesting, I think, any rate. But no, we haven't lost solidarity. What we've lost is industrial solidarity at this moment in time. But if the lorry workers and Unite get their act together, we will have solidarity again. We will have lorry drivers not going through picket lines again. Um, that's something that Unite has to sort out. Do you ever find it like a little bit, I'm going to ask you about that banking story, by the way, because it sounds interesting, but um, do you ever find it a little bit strange that working class people who maybe co don't consider themselves working class anymore, I'm not sure, but working class people will parrot the narrative that, oh, these bloody unions, they're causing havoc and they're doing that. And you're like, well, that is the point of what they're trying to do with the strike. Yes, but that's the boss's fault. And they often blame the people who work in the place rather than the people who created the conditions which ah. left those people with no choice but to yeah. take action. Yeah, look, it's how we do it. I went to a national meeting of uh, Unison um, as a full-term official. Um, and, and, and it was a meeting about, oh, it was Kenneth Clark had just announced that, it, that, that, that he was going to form trusts and he was going to give um, hospital conglomerates the opportunity to become independent trusts and that they could set their own pay levels. And he was smashing, or it was an attempt to smash national pay negotiations. And there was this meeting going on um, and I didn't agree with the bloody word of it. Um, um, uh, you, you don't run away from a problem like that. You run at a problem like that. You give them a bloody nose. That's the only lessons they ever learn, the, the employing classes. So I said, I stood up, spoke, uh, talked about the general situation we were in, and that I believed that what we should do is to pick on the biggest the very first trust that declares itself a trust, we should pick it off. We should pick it off, we should levy our members, we should call a strike and we should smash them. We should break them. And, 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 and it's, it was as important um, as that at that moment in time, that we give them a lesson that they'll never forget. And all of the trusts in the northeast of England or in London or wherever that were watching this would say to themselves, well, we aren't going to become bloody trusts. Not if that's what happens. Um, and it was, it was talked down. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and unfortunately, out of all of the full-time officials that were there at that meeting, and there was hundreds of them, not one person spoke in favour of doing what I'd suggested. Um, so after that meeting, I just decided, bugger it, I'm, um, I'm going to do it myself. And uh, uh, be, but because it was only me, I couldn't I couldn't pick on 
you know, the biggest trust in the northern region because at that stage I was over in Cumbria. So, so I picked on a number of trusts over here. And one of the first groups, and, and it's, it, 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 it covers the point you make about work class people who might not think themselves working class anymore. And it was medical secretaries in Carlisle. And medical secretaries in Carlisle were the same as medical secretaries everywhere. Um, um, but but not, not the most active union members, many of them not members of unions. And I started a campaign to get medical secretaries a pay rise. And I did it on the basis of the personnel officer who'd given himself a directorship in the new trust and had trebled his salary. And the chief executive, who was the uh, a senior officer in the hospital, who became the chief executive, trebled his salary. And I started a campaign saying that if they could treble their salaries, you're working just as hard, if not harder. Your, your, your consultants are working harder, and it's much, much more important work, so we should have a pay rise. The chief executive said they're not getting a pay rise because they're not worth it. That was it. We had lapel stickers made, um, uh, the medical secretaries to kick off the campaign. Never used to go down to the canteen for their lunch. They used to work through the lunches. So they all went to the canteen. They all had their lunches. And as they were going to the canteen, they were slapping lapel stickers on everybody that passed. Uh, uh, visitors, members of staff, um, and the whole bloody hospital was covered in lapel stickers, quoting the chief executive, and 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 it just got better and better and better. Uh, the more stupid the uh, the management were, the 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 stronger the mood amongst the medical secretaries. We had thirty percent of the medical secretaries in the union when we started the campaign, we had 100% when we ended the campaign. We had a ballot for industrial action, never came to a, uh, industrial action. We had a ballot for industrial action. We got exactly what we wanted, everything that we demanded, that gave us, and we maintained 100% membership of the union and those women learned massive 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 lessons about solidarity sticking together and fighting the employer now i immediately went to west cumbria the trust over there knock 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 it's only me guess what we want we want a pay rise for the medical secretaries you can go through what they've been through in Carlisle, or you can give us the same as Carlisle. They gave us, because they knew what they were in for. I then went to Kendall. I then went to Barrow. I then went to Lancaster. And the day I left the union, retired, medical secretaries were the highest paid med medical secretaries in the United Kingdom. Solidarity, sister. That's how it was achieved. There has to be some bloody leadership. There has to be some leadership. Now, the leadership, I'll tell you this little story. How long have we got? Um, um, we had monthly meetings in Newcastle for the full-time officials. And I went to the monthly meeting and I walked into the meeting and it went quiet. And I said, well, hello, do you want me to go out and come back in again? So I went out, came, knocked on the door, came back in. Silence. I said, well, wh what have I done now? And this is an exact quote. You, you, you stupid fucking bastard. What have you been doing with the medical secretaries? They've all been on the phone to our medical secretaries. In Sunderland and Newcastle and Middlesbrough and Durham and Christ knows what. 
And they're saying, you got them a pay rise. And now they want us to get them a pay rise. We've got too much work on our hands. There you go. There you go. Trade union bureaucracy. One of the people that was shouting at us that he had too much work to do drove around with a set of golf clubs in his boot. Um, bad news. Bad news. Um, they then decided that they were going to send me to Berwick on the picket line with the medical secretaries. And I said, Berwick from Carlisle. I'll, I'll help out Newcastle. No, it's Berwick as a punishment. And I said, look, to the head of health, um, how many strikes did I actually have over the medical secretaries? Well, none. And I said, well, and how many strikes have you got over here? Well, dozens. And I said, well, has it ever dawned on you that the people that you're working with over here don't know their arse from their elbow. I get pay rises without strikes. They've got strikes everywhere. I'm not going to Berwick. Um, I'm not going on the picket line to Berwick. Uh, you're not going to kill me off. This, at the same time, was when I was running the biggest equal pay claim that this country had ever seen. They decided they were going to send us to Berwick on a fucking picket line. Um, and and it, it just was, was awful. Awful. Um, I, I, I don't know where they found them. Uh, I, I, I did the same with hospital porters. I did the same with theatre nurses. We had a split situation in Carlisle where about 40% of the theatre nurses were in unison. The rest were in the RCN. Um, we, they had a, an on-call system and it paid them £4.50 a week for being on call all week. <laughs> um, and of course, being the theatre nurse, they were out every bloody night. Um, but it was the same people that were on during the day um, and they were exhausted. And we said, we're not doing it anymore for £4.50. We want 28 quid. And uh, this is like 15 plus year ago. We want 28 quid and we're not doing it anymore. Find some more nurses to do the night shift, um, to do the on-call. Uh, cut a long story short, the RCN said, oh, well, we'll settle for £6, an increase of £1.50. Um, and I said, well, we're not going to do it for, for £1.50. It's 28 quid or it's nothing. Um, and, and if you give us nothing, then you have to find extra nurses. Um, the RCN took a chance, stupid fools, and went to their members. Our members ate them alive. Their own members ate them alive and then all joined unison. And after they all joined unison, that game up. Uh, the, the, the management realised and knew they were in for a fight. If everybody was joining this, this, this horrible union uh, uh, led by Peter Doyle. Um, and, and of course, as soon as we got the, the theatre nurses in, in Carlisle, I went over to West Cumbria. Knock, knock, knock. Hello, it's me again. And we did it in Barra and we went to Lancaster. And, and the day I retired, we had the highest paid theatre nurses in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. And, and the point to this is, if we as a national union had taken on the first trust in the northern region to become a trust and had smashed them into the ground, none of the others would have become trusts. And we would have saved ourselves years and years and years of misery. Misery. But they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. I think there are massive lessons in what you've talked about there. There's massive lessons in solidarity. There's massive lessons in how people should be working together. And, uh, yeah, as you say, not being, not being scared to take people on straight away because there is that 
reticence in trade unions, I think, to do to do it. Oh well, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see how these things work, and <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe and yeah, that happens yeah. in my union quite a lot as well. Oh well, you've got yeah. to let them. You've got to let them fail, even if you know it's going to be a bad idea. And I suppose where we are now, that you kind of have to do that. I test the system quite a lot as a trade union rep. I'm like, okay, you've got a, you've got a really daft plan. Let's do the daft plan, and then I'll say, oh, we tried, and it didn't work. But on a grand scale like that, once it's in there, it's like trusts or academies in my profession. Um, academies are, are doing the same thing as trusts do. You know, they've they've taken away that control of that democratic control locally, haven't yeah. they? Yeah. Well, we booked we booked a hotel in Carlisle uh, for three Saturdays for an afternoon, and we put coffee and scones and biscuits on, and it was for medical secretaries to bring their kids. We put a crash on even. And, and to bring their kids and to talk about the campaign and to talk about what we wanted them to do and to talk about the strategy. Work the treat. Absolutely work the treat. Some people brought their kids for three weekends because <laughs> the kids liked, liked it in the hotel and liked the biscuits and liked the scones and what the hell. Um, and, and, and it worked. And, and that was a tactic that, that I'd not used up and until then to, to bring workers to somewhere that wasn't the workplace or wasn't a pub. Um, and, uh, and it worked and it worked uh, brilliantly. But yeah, solidarity has to be worked for. It's not something that falls out of the sky. And if people have been involved in industrial disputes, they know the importance of picket lines. They know the importance of support from other people. Um, if we lose the ability to take strikes and to take action because of the leadership, um, then no wonder people don't understand it anymore. No wonder people... Um, don't don't think in the way they did um, um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because they haven't done anything like that for 20 years. Oh, terrifying, terrifying. Absolutely. Um, I want to come back to your banking story and then I want to talk about something else. But like, tell me that little banking story if you can, because uh, I'm well, intrigued. what's the other? What's the other else? What's the something? What else? I want to talk about Left Horizons as well. So all right, talk okay. about that. I'm excited okay. to talk about that. Okay, okay, right, banking. <sighs> I I I lodge an equal pay claim. It's a huge equal pay claim. It's in one healthcare trust. It, the attempts to sabotage it were immense. Not from the management, from the union bureaucracy. A man called Paul Marx organized a, a, a meeting, a secret meeting with the head of the healthcare trust nationally with the chief executive and the director of personnel in Carlisle Hospital to find a way out. Unfortunately for him, you couldn't fart in that hospital without me finding out because we had members throughout the secretarial um, staff, we had members everywhere um, and I found out. So I went up to the boardroom and I sat in the boardroom half an hour before the meeting was due to start. Then the chief executive and the personnel officer arrive, and then Paul Marks and the head of uh, the health service walks in um, and saw me sitting there. Um, cut a long story short, at the end of the meeting, they'd offered eight million quid to be shared out. And I said, go to hell, don't be stupid. We're looking at, we're looking at, at the time, we were looking at about 250 million. So don't be daft. They then went up to 18 million while the, while, while the top bureaucrat from the union, the head of health, was sat there. And I said, don't, I'm not prepared to accept that. So the personnel, so 
So the chief executive said, right, we're just going to make the payment and we'll get people to sign on the dotted line and we'll see how many of your members stay loyal to your union when we are offering them 5,000 and 6,000 and 10,000 pound. And I said, I don't really care. If, if, if you offer somebody 10 grand, they've probably never seen 10,000 in their lives in, in one lump sum. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't blame them if they accepted that. But you have to realise that if we only have five people, and we'll have a lot more than that, but if we only have five people who hold to their guns and say, no, we're going to tribunal, then you have to pay everybody, including the people that you've already paid £10,000. And then I turned to the head of health from Unison and I said, Paul, you have to realise that if you negotiate a deal which is less than our members are entitled to and we win at a tribunal, you will be sued by every one of our members for the money they would have got. And that could be 200 plus million pound and you will go down in history as the man who bankrupted the union. And he packed his uh, briefcase and walked out. Uh, we won the biggest equal pay claim in, in the world, some people say, I think Europe. We won 320 million quid for 1,600 women. Some of those nurses, and it wasn't just nurses, but some of those women were walking out of the hospital with checks for 280,000 pound, backdated money, considerably more than 10,000, eh? Um, um it, it, it was huge, but it's the biggest secret in the world. The Unison gave it no publicity. The biggest equal pay claim in the world, maybe. The General Secretary wasn't at the meeting. The rally in Carlisle where we had to vote in favour or against. The Head of Health wasn't there. The Deputy General Secretary wasn't there. No fucker was there. Um, they blanked it out. They didn't want it to happen. I was disciplined twice uh, by the head of health um, on made up charges to try and get me to drop the equal pay claim. Oh, by the way, the head of health at the time in unison is now a Labour MP in Bladen. Liz Twist is her name. <laughs> um, so horrors absolute bloody horrors she sold herself to Derwent side northwest Durham because she wanted to be um, um, an, an MP there and uh, my daughter was there and my daughter said well, you know what about the equal pay claim and she said I know everything about the equal pay claim I was the one that originated it and I was the one that signed it off and my daughter said, well, that's why we don't want you as the MP, because you're telling a pack of lies. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, it worked. And she wasn't selected for Northwest Durham. But uh, a, a huge, 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 um, um, massive equal pay claim. And a, oh, there was a meeting of full-time officials that I was told I wasn't welcome. And that meeting, well, I, I found out every word that was spoken. That meeting was addressed by the head of health. And he said that the equal pay stopped now. If anybody asks about equal pay, refer them to the regional secretary. If anybody asks them, asks about the Carlisle equal pay, refer them to me. The equal pay campaign stops now. Um, so, so that was the actions of a union that's supposed to be there for the interests of ordinary working class people. Fortunately, some big changes are taking place inside of Unison now, and long may they, long may they last. Any rate, banker, I'm taken to a meeting by Dave Prentice, the then General Secretary of the Union to meet John Prescott, 
who was then the cabinet minister for fucking practically everything, but also local government. Um, and 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 John Prescott's comment, I'm, I'm, I'm skating over it very quickly now, was that this equal pay claim in the health service, if it's carried over to other healthcare trusts, um, it'll bankrupt the health service, it'll cost uh, 17 billion pound and, 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 and we will not keep hospitals that go bankrupt open. We let them close, says John Pres Prescott. So Dave Prentice nudges me and says, there you are, Peter, what do you think of that? So I put my hand up. I'm, I mean, I'm nobody. I'm just a lowly full-time official. I'm not a general secretary or a deputy general secretary. They're the only people that ever meet cabinet ministers. So I put my hand up and he said, yes, who are you? So I said, I'm Peter Doyle. I'm the one to blame for the Carlisle equal pay claim. Well, it'll close. It'll, the hospital will close. And I said, John, that's the biggest load of bollocks I've ever heard in my life. You're telling a pack of fucking lies. And why you're doing that when everybody in this room knows you're telling a pack of lies, um, is beyond me. Uh, don't be stupid. You're going to close the only hospital in Cumbria? So people have got 200 mile, 300 mile round trips to get that treatment? Rubbish. Don't be stupid. And stop threatening things like that. And stand up and, 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 and allow this equal pay claim. Not just in the health service, but local government. And he then said, I've got a very important cabinet meeting to go to. And he stood up and walked out. Um, and, and he did have a very, very important cabinet meeting to go to. And I was very grateful that he'd taken the time to come along and tell us a pack of lies. Um, and, and the really, really important cabinet meeting that he had was to vote in favour of invading Iraq. Um, um, and... Uh, so be wary of be wary of moderates. That's all I'm saying. Be wary of moderates and Keir Starmer, basically, um, and anybody that supports Keir Starmer. Any rate, he said seventeen uh, million pound it would cost to bail out the uh, uh, um, all of the hospitals in the United Kingdom if we lodged equal pay claims. 2008, the banks go down with a crash. The very first bank that went crash was Northern Rock. Guess how much they were given? Given. Didn't even, didn't even sign a piece of paper saying we'll pay it back over the next thousand years. They were given £28 billion to bail them out from the banking crash but they couldn't find 17 billion for every single health worker in the, in, the, in the country. They're a disgrace. And then the stuff were with PFI as well. So that's the banker's story. 28 billion for the bankers, not a penny, we are told, for the health workers for equal pay from a Labour government minister. Wow. This is like, and, and this is why I suppose a lot of people were trying to change the Labour Party. Um, and for a while, it looked quite positive there, didn't it? It looked like the, the Labour Party will change it, we'll change it because they've got fuckers like me to deal with. We'll change it, <laughs> we'll change it. I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going anywhere. They expel me, I'll still go along to meetings, I'll stand outside if I have to. They're not getting rid of me after 60 years membership and the service I've put in. I was on the, I was national chairman of the Young Socialists. I was the first youth representative on the NEC of the Labour Party. I've been there, seen it, got the t-shirt. They haven't. They're going to, they're, they're going to have to work very, very hard to get rid of me. Lovely attitude, Peter. I really, really do. Um, it's, it's inspirational. I'm sure a lot of people will think the same as well. Um, so but I'm not, Summer, sorry, I know you want to get on to something else, but I'm, yeah. not a, I'm not a summer warrior. I didn't join in 2005 and leave five years later. I'm not a summer warrior. I'm here for the long run. I'm not here for the Labour Party. 
because if a, another organization comes along, if the unions split and form another party, that's where I'll go. I'm not in love with the Labour Party, but I am able to recognize that every single union in the country is affiliated to the Labour Party. Uh, millions of workers vote for the Labour Party. That's where I need to be. I need to get my hands dirty. Brilliant. Um, absolutely lovely attitude, as I say. Um, so for that kind of inspiration, then let's talk for a few minutes now about uh, your Left Horizons, which is, um, it's it's a publication, isn't it, that comes out, isn't it, yeah. purely online, or do you ever print it? No, no, we have, uh, well, well, what we do is we, two or three times a year, we, we do small pamphlets. Um, we're taking one, the Labour Party conference this year, and it's all the editorials and all the articles about the Labour Party for the last year and a half. And we did a one on uh, green policies and it was all the articles that we'd had on green issues um, condensed into one pamphlet. And um, we give them away. We don't sell them, we give them away. Um, so it costs quite a bit of money, but any rate. Um, but, uh, so we'll have a, a, a website um, and paper journal. We'll have uh, a Facebook page. And we do pamphlets and I hold, I uh, stopped because of COVID, but up and until COVID, I was having regular six weekly meetings, left horizon meetings with guest speakers over, well, it wasn't Zoom, I can't remember what it was now, but it was a clever piece of kit that we had. We would have guest speakers from all over the place and we, we, we regularly had 20 25 people in in in, in my house um so so we'll have meetings we'll have publications we have pamphlets we do model resolutions and we try and take the fight to them it's it's excellent like, you know and and it's one of it's really nice to see this uh this independent form of media because that's quite a big part of the tradition isn't it on the left this independent media because i think some people may think it's a new phenomenon that billionaires own the press but like they've never been in favor of the left have they they've but it's no it's, it's always been we've always done it on our own so how yeah. important is it that we do these things on our own and what more can we well, do to get involved i guess my dad used to say when i used to complain about the daily hail um and the excess and and other newspapers as well my dad used to get the sunday citizen and the daily herald uh two labor papers that weren't that labor but 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 he got them um and i used to complain when i was in, in me uh, early teens and he used to say look they've got the press and we've got the street corners and and the reality is we do we're still there we still have the street corners, only the street corners are a bit smaller now because he included workplaces in those street corners. He included the vicars of the world, uh, the railroads of the world, uh, his bus depot. My dad went out um, and working for oh, 59, the leader of the Labour Party in 1959, Hugh Gaskell, and he dragged me around my mum and him worked for Hugh Gateskill and he dragged me around as a kid out canvassing. Then Hugh Gateskill tried to get rid of Clause 4 and, and, and people like my dad reacted against that. He got about 200 people in his workplace to join the Labour Party. Um, um, oh, it doesn't matter now. It was, it, was, it was decades and decades ago. The union branch paid their subs so they would join, um, and they voted against getting rid of Clause 4. My dad was accused of being a communist. He was on front page of the Gateshead Post, Jimmy the Commie, um, and, and they tried to do him in, and, and that didn't work because that street corner was huge. We have to develop the street corner. You're the street corner. Left Horizons is the street corner. The more people we can get involved, in this type of media um, uh, and 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 uh, web page uh, media, the, the the stronger and the more informed will become. I think you're doing a marvelous job. I really do. 
I'm not just saying that. Well, I think you've spoken to me long enough now to know that if I didn't mean that, I wouldn't say it. Um, but I do. I think you're doing a, more, a, a wonderful job in spreading the message and getting the word out there. Um, and I'm doing my bit um, as well, as much as I can. I was in Militant. I was a founding member of Militant. I was so proud of Militant. I, I was. I was very, very proud of Militant. They achieved a lot. They took control of some unions. They had three MPs. They had a sleeper MP. Um, um, they used Parliament as a platform. My view is Parliament is the problem. It's not part of the solution. It's the fucking problem. But Militant used Parliament as a platform. Those MPs had a platform. They went out in the campaign for socialism. Militant went off the rails, absolutely off the rails, and became ultra-left. They should never have stood a candidate against the Labour Party in Walton. If they hadn't have done that, they would have still been in the Labour Party. Tony Blair wouldn't have ever got rid of Clause 4. Um, you know, it's like there are consequences to everything that we do. And, and I left Milland. I just thought they'd become an ultra-left sect. And it was a great pity, a great pity, because they were my university. They were in my early days. And they had a newspaper and they sold the newspaper. Um, they're still selling the newspaper, only there's not as many of them now. Um, and the vote against left candidates and split votes and do crazy things like that. Um, but this, I mean, I've seen not all of them, and I apologise for that, but I've seen a few. And I started watching when Ray Goodspeed was on, and I just thought, bloody hell, this is great. So I've told loads of people about it. Um, um, and 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 uh, in the same way as I tell them about Left Horizons, we're a group of Marxists. We make no apologies for that. We want to build a Marxist current inside the Labour Party. Marxism, i.e., we want public ownership of the means of production. We want the wealth created as to receive the wealth. Um, um, uh, uh, that's that's the core of it. it. It's much wider than that. But that's the core of it. And, and so we're trying to do that. Some of us are quite old. I'm 75. I've had a triple heart bypass. I've got other various ailments. Um, um, but you don't let that stop you. You don't let that stop you. I hope I'm swearing me fucking head off when I drop dead. Um, and I, hopefully it's at some Tory. Um, um, that that would do me. That would do me fine. That would do me fine. Um, there are lots of things that we can do. I proved it. I came out of school without any O levels, without any academic qualifications, um, and I won the biggest equal pay claim in Europe. I ran rings round barristers and QCs. Oh, I loved it. Honestly, I loved it. That was a part of my job I absolutely adored. I was invited to a meeting over the equal pay claim and the chairman of the trust was there, a guy who owned a range of shops called Bullows, and he was a millionaire. And he sat quiet during this meeting and it ended like all the meetings over equal pay where we agreed to disagree. And... Uh, and we're putting our stuff away um, and, and he leans over and he says, now, Mr. Doyle, I don't know whether, I can't do posh accents. Um, now, Mr. Doyle, um, what is it you really want? And quick as a flash, I said, well, actually, I want world socialism, but a fucking good pay rise will do in the meantime. Um, and uh, and they're just, we're, we're in awe of the, of, of the owners of production and there is thick as shit by and large um, we shouldn't be in awe of any of them and I'm living proof that somebody from Gateshead can do big things if they just apply themselves <laughs>
Uh, it's <laughs> such a good message and we absolutely love it. And that's what we're about. And thank you so much for the, the compliments on the channel. We're trying to do the same things, aren't we? At Left Horizons and Socialist Think Tank, get that message out there. Um, so for Socialist Think Tank, you can go to socialistthinktank.com and become a member. It's free. Do subscribe to all of our channels, right. Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. And how do we do the Left Horizons thing? What do we do? So there's Facebook to do. And you can, you've also got a, a weekly newsletter, don't you? If you can sign yes. up the weekly newsletter and what we'll yep. do is we'll put that in the description of this video when it goes out so people can click on that and uh and get themselves subscribed to that because it is well worth subscribing to left horizon so brilliant work some absolutely brilliant articles and uh so much better than what you get in the mainstream media and in much of the left media as well yeah. it's uh yeah, it's, not off. it's absolutely outstanding Peter, i want to thank you um have you got a final message for me? Because I don't want to end this one because I've had a great time sitting and listening to these stories. Have you got a final message for people and then uh, so that we can finish on you? You can be up against it. You can be up against a vicious management. You can be up against a pathetic um, support team in your union. As long as you have the members trust, you have to get the members trust. And the way you get the members trust is to work hard for them. Work hard for them. Um, oh, don't wear a suit. I used to turn up at meetings in a t-shirt and jeans and a boxer um, jacket. And I used to roll my own cigarettes and I used to think, oh, here's this thick Geordie. And they used to prattle on forever. And then I used to just destroy them. Um, I could do that because I had the trust of members. I'd worked hard for members. That's how you do it. People are people. People will see you for what you are. If you work hard, they'll see past the jeans and the T-shirts and rolling your own cigarettes. And they'll become to trust you with everything. And, and, and I got away with murder because I had thousands and thousands and thousands of members who had me back. Not the union who had me back, the members had me back. And, and that's important. You can do it as well. It's hard, it's difficult, there are setbacks, but by God, the successes are wonderful. The successes are the best thing in the world for anyone. You don't have to be a union organiser to experience that. So work hard, build members, membership, get members to trust you, and you can achieve an awful lot. That's it. We'll keep the red flag flying here.